All right, Tim, we're back. And this week we're talking about performance. What is performance? Well, let's build off what we talked about last week. The idea that health is preventing the decline that we take for granted that we should be avoiding the gradual drop in health and associated with age, uh, maybe redundant activities, where performance is the opposite vector. It's this, I'm driving towards something intentionally that's hopefully better than when I started. And that's going to be the accumulation of efforts and execution and having a targeted focus, uh, which I don't necessarily think they fit perfectly in this duality concept of health is the preventing the decline and then performance is the pushing hard in the direction. It's not going to have that symbiotic, perfect, harmonious relationship that one is you know, the up and the other one's down or the variables that are associated with duality. But I do think there is a, an association that health is performance. And, you know, on some level, we could argue that you should always optimize your health and you should prioritize being the best version of yourself. But I think there's a lot of crossover and definition that when we think about doing extended steady state cardiovascular exercise or meditation or journaling and being more mindful uh, for a more, uh, just a more robust level of health that is synonymous with performance. It's really not. I, I, I genuinely believe that performance is an intentional target. And we'll, we'll talk about how we apply and layer in stress to do that. But one of the concepts that I hopefully want to you know talk about here will be when we talk about health, we have an expectation that, you know, doing healthy activities is going to lead to better performance. And it's not always the same, you know, and it's the hopefully giving a better foundation for performance and not blockading what we want to accomplish through training or direct application of stress or maybe in the restriction of something through diet and and avoiding other activities that are counterproductive. But, you know, the the element here is. There is one aspect that we talked a lot about last week with health that is hopefully preventing the decline of things that are naturally going to decay over time. And there's another aspect of performance, which might go into a different time scale. And that, that might be a cool direction we want to go with this is that performance is a very time oriented thing that we only have windows that we can really line up performance for where health is a never ending cycle of constantly, constantly, hopefully holding the ship and maintaining what we got, if not accentuating areas that are going to more rapidly decline if we're not conscious of it. So what areas should we be accentuating? I mean, I know performance is largely going to be context dependent, but is yeah. there like some baseline levels of health that we should be accentuating so that when the time comes and we're looking to peak and you know, whatever that we're ready to do so. I think it falls into what I kind of call archetypes and in the gen pop setting, it's going to be, I want to look better predominantly, you know, the folks will tell me I want to feel better, um, which is, is difficult in that way, right? The more vague, the, the objective, the harder it is to actually accomplish that objective. It just means there's a lot more discrepancy and, or uh, a lot more open for interpretation of what's positive versus, Hey, I want to lose 15 pounds or, I want to get sub 10% body fat. You know, those are tangible, very objective things that we can assess and appraise the quality of our performance based off of getting or not getting. And, you know, that's from a general population perspective, it's usually the root of everything. And it's funny, the association with, with certain solutions that are people feel are more congruent. And the, I think the, the problem with, uh, looking at social media or trying to get information yourself and trying to become more informed is you're going to get very strong opinions. The, this is the only way to get more lean muscle, or this is the only way to burn body fat. It's multivariate. Humans are open systems, as we talked about last time, that we procure energy from the outside world, and we metabolize and break down energy differently in our body, just as what it is, from an age, muscle fiber type, mitochondria density, cardiovascular function, endocrine function, immune function, central nervous system function, like all that stuff has a huge impact systemically on how we just break down a calorie and use that as an energy and energy substrate. And the, the problem, though, 
when we start to form some sort of, I guess, vector, right? We start taking some steps forward towards a goal. We start to solicit as much information as we possibly can. And this maybe creates some sort of overload of information. And we go to the most ob objective or the most like absolute answer, you know, like the, there's only one way to put on lean muscle mass and it comes down to squat bench and deadlift and that narrative. And, you know, I find if we just took a second to appraise the messenger, you probably get a lot more perspective on how accurate that message actually is. But on the other note, we can get into this conversation off of when we think about trying to evaluate the best steps, you know, we, we should get down to principles. We should get down to what is objectively true. And then we should hopefully find the path of least resistance that's going to get us there quickest. And a lot of times that is doing time-tested proven methods that, you know, a lot of people have come to agreement is there, but other times there's, you have your own individual nuance. And one of the principles is individuality, meaning that we're all going to respond differently to the same stress and having an association with that and saying, there's no ever one perfect fit that your body has to find organic solutions to the problems that we're presenting to it through training. Then, then we start to get closer to it. On the other end of the spectrum, we can talk about performance and performance has some sort of association, a performance in the athletic environment, I should say, not just general performance, but performance should have an association with something in regards to competition and strength sports are pretty easy, right? Can I get more weight overhead and weightlifting between snatch and clean and jerk? Can I get to the benchmark positions within uh, a powerlifting competition? Can I get to a specific time or load lifted in a strongman competition, right? Those are pretty like cut and dry, black and white. You know, you look at, I would argue that bodybuilding kind of fits within the aesthetic more gen pop goals, but still the association is that actually has a winner and a loser. So there's performance outcomes there as well. And then when we look at athletic competitions and we have cyclical and acyclical sports, like essentially do we repeat the same activity over and over again, or do we have a lot of randomized environments? So team sports, basketball, football, lacrosse, soccer, name all of them, that's going to be acyclical. There's no redundancy with the patterns versus sprinting or biking or swimming. Those are going to be more cyclical. We're repeating the same action over and over again to a point B and with more Olympic sports or cyclical sports, it's a little easier to quantify the impact on what you do from a training perspective. So if we're trying to sit down with his performance, did I cross a line faster it means you did a good job with organizing your performance, right? From the allocation of stress, from the restriction of things that are counterproductive to that stress, you know, you did everything right, right? You crossed the line faster or you beat your counterpart, you win, right? That's pretty cut and dry. Where it gets really, really hard to pin down is the team sports or the acyclical sports, right? The, the lack there of 100% correspondence from anything you're doing from a training perspective or omission perspective is harder to quantify and evaluate whether it's directly there. But we have a lot of you know, frameworks and archetypes that we just presented, right? We have gen pop, more static, I want to lose body fat, gain muscle, you know, just what they would classify as look better. And you have to almost push them into a corner to say, what does that actually mean? Right? What is the association now? Or what's that going to get you? And then getting something tangible that you can work off of, right? That I just want to look better. Like that won't really get you much progress because it's not actual physically tangible enough to actually get any inertia created. Mm -hmm. On the other end, we have the difference between cyclical and acyclical sports and cyclical is easier to define and create criteria for what is good and bad. And then the acyclical stuff, which I think a lot of the problem emerges from what is performance, relatively speaking, to team sports. Like what is a good performance for a strength conditioning department for a football team? It's really hard to define, right? And, you know, like if anyone's ever heard me talk or listened to me before, like, you know, I try to make sense of a very complex world by saying, okay, well, did they run faster? Did they jump higher? Did they throw something further? Like those, those are pretty general qualities that probably are going to be emblematic of what you did training wise and hopefully have some sort of connection to 
what they need to do during football or basketball or whatever else they're playing. And it gives me some sort of, okay, I did a good job from the allocation of stress and these are the benchmarks I wanted to hit. And in theory, they should be more physically prepared for the sport they're about to play. And then we can evaluate whether that was accurate or not, or maybe whatever improvement was unnecessary, relatively speaking, to playing at a higher level. And that could come in the form of getting more playing time, starting as opposed to being the backup, making the travel squad. That could be had made All-American this year, which is a lot of other variables associated with that, or team goals if we wanted to win a conference championship game and go to a bowl game or whatever other things that are really important to that team. But, you know, as a whole, the idea of performance is pushing towards something agreed upon that's clearly defined from before or the onset of an offseason or training program that you can go back and say, did we or did we not meet that goal? and evaluate whether it was two-pronged. Was it the execution or was it the hypothesis behind our training? And that's the part for me I get the most excited for. And I love the idea of health because I think it's foundational, but I definitely think it's the, it's the chop wood, carry water of like, just make sure you're sleeping, drinking water, eating plenty of, of produce with fiber, getting enough animal protein within your diet. Like just, you know, simple things done violently well over time versus performance is there's a there's an art and there's a skill to that. And not everyone can get better performance and not everyone can do that over time. And there are people who get lucky and just randomly apply stress. And that was net positive. And there's people that are extremely good and talented at writing programs and organizing that program, getting great execution, having a human connection that motivates and inspires that person to do the little things every day. That's going to get great results over time. You know, that's where I find is the most exciting and compelling. That's why I'm a strength coach is because I have a great opportunity to do something profound and special where a lot of other people want to, but just simply can't. And it comes down from, you know, reading books and going to seminars and getting reps and having these conversations and getting feedback and learning from every mistake and growing from that. That's where I think performance is. And, you know, I think the, the, the premise of performance and going back to the original construct Performance is different than health, meaning that we have something to accomplish. And if we don't accomplish it, we have accomplish it. We should have something to answer to the client or athlete that paid us to do that or gave us their energy and time to get them something they didn't have. You know, we're held accountable to that. And I think that's performance. And I think general pop should hold their trainers and their coaches more accountable to that athletes and Sport coaches should hold their trainers and strength coaches more accountable to that. And ourselves, you know, peer to peer or whoever else out there, you know, we have a responsibility to, to make sure that we're keeping that objective in there. And one of the things that I think is going to be probably more, more available to us as we go with artificial intelligence or machine learning is what is actually objectively true and kind of sifting through opinion and per perspectives and biases and this, the silly like concept of you're wrong. You shouldn't do that. Like, well, you, I would argue that I'm not considering I've had great results over the past 20 years. So you have really no claim to say that I'm wrong in anything. I could use a weightlifting or I can use certain progressions and speed drills. Like I saw a video, how a skips are dumb. Like, well, I do a skips and make people faster. So how is that dumb? Really I don't understand. Cool. I, I, I find that like notion of like saying something is bad or good is, is incredibly silly, but if it gets better performance, I don't really care about your opinion. You know, like, you know, my right is more right than yours because I have evidence and you don't. So what do you say to that? Which I think that's performance and that's our job as a strength coach or performance coach. Hence the name of like performance coach. Yep. I really like that you mentioned, you know, the art and the, the puzzle solving of writing a program. Like you should be objectively better than when you started, whether that's moving pain-free moving more weight or just you're getting through the workouts more efficiently. Like that should, you are better than where you started and like health, there's not really an endpoint. We're probably going to try to be healthy forever performance. There is that objective criteria. There is that there, there's that endpoint. Like we're trying to get better for this thing, whatever that is. One thing I wanted to tease out that you kept, you keep coming back to is stress. So stress is what like stress is bad. Can we, how, how do we handle that? Like, I'm stressed. That's bad. That's typically the context that, that we hear it in, but what is stress and how does it impact performance? We mentioned it in the health 
podcast, but the concept of hormesis or the foundation for uh, pharmaceuticals and and understanding that the difference between the antidote and the poison is the quantity and the frequency. And in that that element is is pretty profound when we look at stress, that I can have the lock and key to everything that you ever want to accomplish by understanding how much stress, and stress can come in the form of a rep, it could come in the form of aggregated reps over a set, it could come in the form of aggregated time and retention over a set or work, it could come in the form of that aggregated time period or time variable like a set or period of work with intensity so what was the rate or the amount that i had to do something and then it could come in the form of density within a set period of time like a training session right so if we just keep it simple like right the anyone who's listening to this is maybe kind of like okay well what is stress right the, and it's a great question because the way a strength coach would approach this is I'm going to apply variables. I'm going to apply, I'm going to pick an exercise and then I'm going to say, okay, how, how many reps, how long does each rep need to take and how many sets do I need to get to get the value from that exercise? And then what's the rest in between and what's the intensity I need to do to get there as fast as humanly possible, right? So Corey, you want to be able to run faster. I do an analysis on you and find out that you're you're weak. You're you're as weak as a puppy coming out of the, on his first steps, and you're trying to run faster. So we find out your relative strength is really poor. I go, okay, I think these exercises like a front squat and a snatch grip RDL are going to be really really important for you to develop that off a biomechanical screen and an appraisal of what exercises would be best for you. And then I start to look at it from, oh, I need to improve your strength. I only have six weeks. I start to think after I select those exercises, I pick reps, how many reps per set that I need to do, time and retention based off of what contraction profile that you create, the intensity we need to do it at, the amount of total sets we need to do, and how much rest do we need. And that's not, like that's that's a construct of stress within a training program, right? It's a rep, time under tension, the intensity per that rep and the time under tension, the amount of time under tension or reps within a set, how many sets. And we start to think about that collectively over time. And you as a listener can probably keep it a lot more simple and don't need to get into the nuance of variables. Just think about how long do I need to do something and how intense does that need to be for me to get some sort of positive effect? Going back to hermesis. This idea of the difference between the antidote and the poison is the quantity and the frequency, right? So if I look at, we're going to do 30 seconds of work at 100% intensity, and I'm going to do that 30-second bout every two minutes for 10 minutes, is that going to be too much or too little? Unfortunately, we don't really know that until after. Right? It's usually an output measure that determines the success of our progress. And even with that, we really don't know what the actual difference would be if I did a different protocol. We don't have a control with you specifically. There's no way we can have a control here. So we don't know if it was not enough or too much or too little until after the fact. And then we don't know what the difference would be if we did something different because we don't have a control. Because of even if you did, had if you had a twin, Corey, and you were both equally weak and you both needed to get faster and you did one that was 30 seconds in length for 10 minutes or two, uh, every two minutes and one that was 15 seconds in length every minute for 10 minutes and one improved more than the other. It's still not a good control considering that you are different no matter what. And Corey A slept eight hours a night for the, for the eight weeks we did this protocol. Corey B slept six. You know, Corey A was had a had no girlfriend and no problems outside of training. And Corey B basically went through three different relationships and struggled to get to training every fourth time. And there's all these beautiful nuances with every single person that goes to principle number one, individual. Individual response is gonna be different. And we know we have a specificity of getting you guys stronger to make you guys run faster. But the point of all this is when you really get down to it, that is why we need to track, measure, and quantify. You know, we, we said it before, what gets measured gets managed. Yep. And every week, 
what a professional would do. And this is kind of why, like, giving back to the, the point of application of stress is really, really complex. And if you're literally going on social media or getting on your Reddit and trying to figure out the best way to get a program, they're not taking any consideration of how you're going to respond and react to that said stress. And a professional can hopefully figure out the, ra the rate and the reaction to that stress and determine if it's turning into the antidote or an actual poison. And you want to find that out early as opposed to later so you can hopefully get as much result as possible from that. And the analogy or the metaphor we always tell our clients is we have a towel filled with water and your ability to get as much water out of that towel to dry yourself off after the next shower really determines off of how much and how often you wring that towel. And the good ones will be able to have a completely dry towel at the end of a training block. The ones that have squandered the missed opportunities by not getting in enough or not squeezing that towel hard enough will have a very wet towel when it comes to dry off in the next shower. And when you're thinking about training, you're thinking about how much can I get from each session and then how much can I get over a period of time? And what's the optimal amount of times I need to do that within that period of time? And that becomes performance. And the ones that can get better results to have the metaphor of a drier towel at the end of the, the training block are the ones that are gonna get more and more value. And they pick the right horse in terms of a trainer. And that will be the difference. And when we look at performance and stress and we think about this from a high level, you know, you want to look at this from stress is a good thing until it's not. And you want to be always on the side of good. And there's a concept of minimal effective dose, which, you know, to be honest, I think is, is a good strategy for everyone in a general sense. It's a bad strategy for people that actually have skin in the game and need to produce, right? Like I've used the other metaphor of if I know that all the, I know that in a roulette like kind of scenario that there's a magnet under a number and I'm kind of afraid to commit, but yet I know it's going to win. What are you holding back for? Like I do enough screening and evaluation to know what that roulette ball is going to fall on. I'm putting all my chips on that number. I'm going to let it ride. And a novice or someone is not, doesn't have that information and isn't able to zero in on what is needed and that's why you take a minimal effective dose and you always go, we're always going to be on the air of antidote by doing not an, by almost doing too little. So we never do too much versus a really, really qualified person and the difference person, right? The, the person that's extremely skilled and has a fantastic level of ability to allocate stress in a certain period of time over a long period of time to get the best possible results is just playing with a different level of knowledge. And yeah, I have a bandwidth to understand what is too much, but I'm always going to toe the line to being right below that so I can get more results than you. And that's what having a trained professional really is. And that's the secret here. It's performance is understanding that you get what you put in and the better people are better at putting it in than, than the other ones who aren't. So how do we filter out like, okay, I'm information overload. I've no, like I've tried it on my own. I can't figure it out. Like you just said all the reasons someone probably needs to look at hiring a professional. How do we find a good coach or trainer? Like what should we be looking for? So that's a real, actually a really good question. And I don't think there's an easy answer because the good ones right. are probably the ones who are not very good at selling themselves. To be honest, they're focused on training people. Their results speak for themselves, but that doesn't necessarily speak loud enough to most people. Uh, right. which is the unfortunate truth, right? The best trainers are the ones who are focusing on training people, not selling their training. Cause that's the great irony of all this. If they were so good at training, they wouldn't need to go out there and sell their, what they do as much as they do. Right. And, and I'm not trying to be dismissive of like, there are phenomenal coaches that are just also happen to be really good salespeople. And they're, it's not a bad thing to be able to sell yourself. And quite frankly, I think strength conditioning as a whole would benefit from, taking a couple sales and marketing classes to help market themselves and, and get themselves a little bit more light shine on them. But as a whole, you know, your probably best indicator is if they're overly focused on selling themselves, they're probably not as focused on delivering what you need to get done. And it's not an easy thing to, to answer, to be completely frank, but you know, that's usually the consensus here. It's a, uh, Hey, I going to get great results. And, you know, it's really what matters here. But 
I would say probably your best gauge of what is a good trainer is someone who just asks a lot of questions and is really curious about you, right? If they just tell you how what they're going to get you as opposed to figuring out what you need by asking a load of questions, you probably should have your guard up and go, well, how is that relative to me? Because there is a principle of individuality that we need to account for. And if you aren't doing a dialed in, really, really comprehensive screen and evaluation, how do I really know that you're going to take into consideration my individual differences from the rest of the people? And anyone can just assign anecdotal evidence or a program that worked in a one-off situation. And then you get the generic, well, you didn't come as often as you should, or I don't know, you, you didn't really execute as well as you should have. So that's why we didn't get great results versus and that's part of the equation, right? The, if it's too much, then we're going to struggle to get the results that we want based off of them not being able to be successful with that program. And we need to understand that well in advance. If it's not enough of the motivational chart of their low skill, low motivation, and not giving them a bunch of wins of like every day they walk in and going, oh, okay, you crushed that, great job, and then building momentum and, and creating inertia, you know, that process is something that you find out in the evaluation versus the super type A, like, bro, I don't need this. I'm better than you. I know more than you do. Like, you know, the, okay, uh, like, don't, don't get it twisted, man. Like I can knock you down a couple pegs. I definitely know more than you and I'm going to break it down to you. I'm going to do things with you and I'm going to hit you hard. And I've experienced all of those every day. I have such a, a spectrum of of extremely, extremely highly motivated type A, successful, like I can do what you do better than you do, I just choose not to do that type mentalities. And then the other end of the spectrum of like, I don't really wanna do this, I have no motivation to do it, I'm struggling to really understand why I'm here, uh, I, I just don't know how to handle this. And it just all is the same thing. Questions, 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 and asking some sort of follow-up and, and keep teasing out a objective agreed upon answer, like, and then getting to the point where they just kind of answer themselves of like, what's going to get you over the hump and what's going to get you to where you want to go and how can I best help you and serve you in this path in this, in this, in this program and breaking down their individual difference. But ironically, that's the secret to sales. You just keep asking questions and make it feel like you are vested in them and they're going to come to an epiphany of what you offer and provide is the best thing in the world and that part of it too. So if you're a person out there looking at, I want to get a trainer or I want to join a gym, you know, I think what you really need to look at is how many questions are they asking about you? And if they ask none and they basically just tell you, we already have the answer, you probably should maybe try it. Maybe you figure it out. Maybe you just want the other aspects of the community, the convenience, it's close to your home. They got showers, they got amenities. That's all part of it. But the other note, is if they're vested in getting the best results for you, because this is performance now, it's not health, it's gonna come down to getting more information on you to make the best plan possible. Yeah, man, that's, it's hard because on, on the one end, like you said, that the good trainers are training, but on the other end, like a good trainer should be able to let you know what kind of value they're going to be bringing to you. And a lot of that stems from those questions, like you said, like, okay, they're, Explain that to me more. What's your goal? And then you just keep digging. Why, 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 why? You just use that why waterfall until you get to that deeper answer and just as much information as possible. So this was super helpful, Tim. I think we, I think you nailed it on performance and what we should look for in trainers. So thank you. Yeah. Well, I hope I did. I hope the people listening to this are getting value from that. And, you know, I think generally, Corey, I think you would agree with this is the central theme here is there is a element that there's a lot of information mm -hmm. and when we go through this stuff and we go through the podcast and the web shows that we do, I, I don't think anyone's going to doubt the fact that we have a pretty good working knowledge of what we do, why we do it and how we do it. Is that helping? And I think these conversations and going into even what you, what I just told you I do with my clients and so hopefully I get the most information you're doing with me. You're not accepting an answer until you get to some sort of definitive that makes sense. And I hope that resonates with you guys out there. And I hope you guys are taking value from this. And we're going to keep 
going in that direction. So I really appreciate the time and, you know, that, that level of detail that you're demanding from me, because that's what I would expect from myself working with a client. So hopefully that's translating to everyone else out there. Yeah, hopefully. And that was a big part of, you know, why I wanted to do this. Like every time we have these conversations, I take something away like that I can start applying immediately. So hopefully that's happening with our listeners too, because these are fun. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Corey. Thanks, Tim.